Good morning. All right. There you go. So, good morning, and good welcome morning. to the. Good morning. All right. <laughs> One more time. All right. Good morning. Good morning. And, morning. and welcome to the First United Methodist Church. Thank you for coming today, and thank you for welcoming Troop 99 Boy Scouts, Pac 99 Cub Scouts, and our friends at the Sea Scouts from Ship 1117. We are happy to be here on a day that scouts across the country participate in Scout Sunday. Now I would like to wel welcome up Pastor Ken for some brief announcements. Good morning, Saints of... Oh, my goodness. Woo! Yes, Lord. <laughs> I love it, Fred. Can I have you follow me around and do that all the time? I love that. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to see you in God's house on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's Super Sunday. We happen to think every Sunday is super around here at First Church, so we're glad you're with us. We do ask all of you, whether you're a first-time visitor, a long-time member, or somewhere in between, if you'll sign that registration pad that you find at the end of your row that we might have a record of your attendance with us on this Lord's Day. We'd appreciate that, but we're thrilled that you're with us in worship. We thank our scout friends for being with us today and for their leadership in worship. I want to share with you just a few very quick announcements. Some of you, like me, probably get busy and have a tendency maybe to forget some things from time to time. I just about forgot but I've got my baby bottle for the Coastal Pregnancy Center. It's full. I just need to bring it and drop it off. Some of you probably are in the same predicament. So this is a chance for us to, to stand for life in our community and encourage you to, to uh, fill yours up and bring it back so we can uh, support that very worthy ministry in our midst. Uh, I am glad to see our scout friends here. Uh, the leadership are, are doing a great job to help make these... Uh, young boys into young men, and we're grateful for that. That's an important thing. And uh, speaking along those lines, beginning Wednesday night at 6.30, I'll be leading a study for men entitled Fight, Winning the Battles That Matter Most. Um, it's by Craig Greshel. It's going to talk to us about uh, not only the, uh, the permission to, but the downright duty of men in God's family to be the men they've been called to be. So I want to encourage you, if you're curious about that, join us in the fellowship class Wednesday evening uh, at 6.30 as we enter into this time of study, what it means to be godly men, and we hope you'll come be a part of that. Um, we do have uh, a, a uh, really special project going on. Paula, did you want to say something about that? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Uh, you might have been seeing a host of the last three weeks we've been on We'd love to send Valentine's for you. Uh, this project, it says that we're going to finish it up on Tuesday, but you can drop them off this week anytime, probably Thursday or Friday. We'll pick up the last ones and get them in the mail. So this is an easy way to send somebody an honor somebody, uh, an, a favorite aunt, a relative, an older person in the church. It's just an easy way, and it, you'll see this is an example of what the Valentine looks like, and it tells them that you're honoring them, and we will use this money for missions here, local missions in our church. Okay, thanks. Uh, you received when you came in a, uh, a little trifold call. We are all called to serve, everyone in ministry together. This is a uh, ministry survey put together by our folks on the worship uh, committee. We want to invite you to take a look at that and very prayerfully consider where you would like to see yourself serving in the life of our congregation. And uh, Miss Pam, how can they return that to us? There is a box out at the welcome desk. When you fill this out, when you're finished filling it out, you need to put it in the box out there at the welcome desk. And I promise you, you will see it again. This is a very important thing. So we, we thank the worship committee for putting it together for us. We encourage you to fill it out. Also, I wanted to let you know that uh, this, uh, at the end of the week, we sent out a, a mailing uh, on behalf of the stewardship committee. Uh, we're sending out our pledge cards for this year along with a letter that sort of talks about what it means to be a part of that. We are entering into a month where we're going to be emphasizing the idea of stewardship. We'd like for you to take that pledge card, 
prayerfully consider what you're able to, to give in support of the congregation and return the pledge card uh, to, the, to the office. Uh, we'd appreciate that very much, but uh, we ask that you will really prayerfully consider what you can do to help us. Uh, it's because of your generous uh, giving that we're able to do the many things that we do. So we want you to really, really take some time to consider that and turn that back in. I don't think there are any other announcements. It is one, sorry, yes, okay, go ahead, brother. Uh, that is that we are going to have jam tonight at 5 o'clock for K through 5th grade, but we will finish at quarter to 6, 15 minutes early for reasons that are rather obvious. Really quick, I was just reminded, we need to make an announcement. We, we had a wonderful women's conference uh, last weekend. Remind us on the 3rd and 4th of March, we're going to have the men's conference. It'll be here. And we're looking forward to that uh, a time of fellowship among the men within our community. We want to encourage you to be a part of that. There are sign-up uh, sheets, I'm sure, out in the vestibule area. We even have a website for that as well. So we encourage you to uh, go ahead and register for that time together. Having no other announcements, we want to invite our scouts to continue to lead us in, in our worship.
Church members have devoted their time, their expertise, and their money, of course, to support what we do. We thank you for the support of any time that you would give us. Do you know that every time we have a church meeting, we promise our, to meet our duty to God, and we state our intent to reverence. Do you know that every time a scout advances in rank, he is asked to explain to an adult what reverence and duty to God means to him. We do not all shame share the same faith journey and no specific path is assigned to us in scouting. But, this, but the support of this church provides with the supportive environment in which we can learn and grow. We feel the support of this Methodist family and every time we meet, we appreciate you guys. Will the call for the hat report call? Pinewood Derby Race, Rain Gutter Regatta, Hanging Tags and Picking Up Food for Scouting for Food, and Soccer Field Trash Pickup. This, this year, the pack participated in the Camperie at Camp Sam Hatcher, where the Weeblos won and Cub Scouts were in a Dutch oven cook-off. The boys cut fresh vegetables and handled all the cooking with minimum assistance from den leader Robbie King. In March, we had our annual Blue and Gold Banquet, at which time all the scouts were presented their badges, followed by the crossover ceremony for progression to the next level. Pastor Danny helped, on work, helped us work on God and Me badge. Pastor Ken is currently helping Weeblos, too, with God and Family. Last summer, we had 22 scouts participate in the Pitt Derby Pitt District Twilight Camp, where the scouts worked on their achievements. We visited children museums and science center in Rocky Mount and closed out our summer with a super fun pool party and cookout. Our scouts participated in the ECU Cub Fun Day with the ECU cadets led by Mr. Josh Moffitt. We got to practice the hanging rope bridge, learn about first aid emergency awareness, received MREs, learned to shoot the ECU cannon, and participated in 3D electronic target shooting. Our fundraiser efforts were once again a huge success. We were able to finish purchasing items to complete Pinewood Derby Check and have been able to let the boys be rewarded with their efforts in supporting the pack by having money to go towards the individual scouting activities. Pac-99 participated in both the Washington and Bath Christmas parades. We had a great Christmas party with each team putting on a skit and delicious snacks were served at the end. Several of our adult leaders were recognized during the Blackbeard District Recogni Recognition Banquet. Dorothy Alligood, Wolf, one, Wolf Den 1 leader, Brian Miller, Bear Den leader, Robbie King, Weebles 1 Den leader, Jay Moore, Weebles 2 Den leader, Betty Wooler, PAC committee member. We would like to thank First, U Meth First United Methodist Church for supporting our Cub Scout PAC over the last year. In our hearts as we uh, enter into a time of singing and praise. There's lots of different types of power and strength. Uh, if any one of us were called by one of the coaches of uh, the two teams that we'll be meeting later today and said, you know, we're one player short. We need a, a linebacker. Would you please come? And, and, you know, if we were to do that, somehow be transported, looking across 
at that other linebacker on the other team, you would think, I'm going to be killed. I've never seen such power and strength and might in all my life as that guy that's going to come just cream me. But there's different kinds of power and strength, and we're going to start off by singing, All hail the power of Jesus' name power that can transform our lives, it can give us strength through the difficulties and challenges of life. Let's sing about it. Here we go. <clears throat> One, two, another in the name of the Lord this morning. Well, it don't matter. We need our 
This next song is one of one of my favorites. Um, we need to be transformed by the Lord from the inside out. Let His Spirit just come on, come on in. You know, we put up so many walls and barriers, and uh, it's time to time to let them go. Just let His Spirit come on in. Come on in, Lord. Thank you. 
soul, the childlike soul that says, yes, Lord, come on in. I need you. I need you. Win the victory of my life struggle that you might be the champion when my game's over. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Can the young disciples come forward? Have you ever noticed how a star, just a pinprick of light, can stand out in the dark night? One speck of light can break through the darkness and can be seen by all. Have you also noticed that when putting a grain of salt on your tongue that is surprisingly strong or its small size? God told his disciples that they were the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And all of us can be as well if we share the light of his word. Now, Eddie has a special talent I'd like to share with us today as he offers a gift of music to God. Eddie, could you play for us?
Thank you, Eddie. Thank you for showing how you can use your talent as a gift to God. Now I'd like everyone to think how they can use their gifts or talents to serve God. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for making us different with different talents. Please lead me doing what I'm able to do to save you. In his name we pray. Amen. No, I'm just putting this back. That's a tough act to follow right there. I'd like to start off praise and prayers uh, with a praise for all of the young folks that are here and the leadership that they're showing and uh, leading us through this worship time. Um, any praises? We'll start over on this side. My dad loves. Okay. Other praises? Okay, let's move over to this section. Any praises over here? All right. I'm going to get your workout in today. Now we'll move over here. <laughs> wow, she knew that. Right away, she comes to you. Oh God, every day is a blessing for me, and I thank God for every day being with me, and every day encouraging me to pray, and, and, and um, anoint those who are around me, and be anointed by me. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you for my church. We're, today's our last Sunday here. We leave now. My day. No, I don't want to go, but, you know, sometimes the Lord has a way. Lee? I'd like to ask for praises and prayers for our military and military families, especially Susie and Jim's uh, son-in-law, John, who just deployed yesterday for nine months in Iraq. Yes. Special prayer there. Other prayers? Okay. Um, I'm just asking for prayers for Jack Willard. Uh, for those of you that don't know Jack personally, I, if you've been in Belch, you've seen him. He's a real tall guy that's about my age. Uh, yesterday, the tragic accident in Craven County took the life of his daughter, oh, nice. uh, Patricia. And uh, her daughter, Ashley, was in the car with her, and she is invited to Greenville. So if you'll play, pray for Jack and his family. Mm. Okay. We missed one back in the back here. It might be cold outside, but when I come here, it warms my heart. Thank you, Jesus. I got one up here in the front. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, two nights ago, the Cub Scout pack in Chocolinity challenged the Cub Scout pack over here in Washington, 99, to collect more food for a scout for food. And when I called Robbie King to make that challenge, he said, hey, I'm so sorry, I don't think it's a fair fight. And I agreed. <laughs> so, uh, you may have gotten a flyer in your mailbox or on your door yesterday. All the food, the non-perishable items that are collected go to Eagle's Wings over the course of this week. So on Saturday, all the scouts on both sides of the river will be going and collecting that food. Uh, if you do not live in the neighborhood that received one of those flyers, if you live on the south side of the river, you can drop food off at my office, which is directly beside the pharmacy in Chocolate 
And if you live on the north side of the river, you can drive across the bridge and drop food off at my office. <laughs> Trying to even the odds there a little, huh? Right here in the front. I'd like to ask prayers for my daughter, Karen, who will be having surgery probably in the next week. Prayers for her. I'd like uh, prayers uh, for my uh, niece, Sean Goodridge. Uh, she's been uh, diagnosed with lung cancer, and uh, so just ask for your prayers in support of that. Thank you. Other praises or prayers? Prayer request for me to start remembering my glasses. I was handed this. Can't get it out there far enough. Lord, we have heard the voices of your children and we lift them up to you, God. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, Father who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy Amen. will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, Saints of First Church. It is a joy to see you this morning. Well, it's good to be seen. Thank you. Props. I want to share with you a passage of Scripture from the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there with me. We'll give you permission to use that Bible app on your iPhone if you have that as well. Or you can certainly look at the screen as well. Give, an ear, give ear now to the reading of God's word. These are the words of Jesus. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Beloved, the word of God for the people of God and the house of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, as your scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, may we hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. I want to ask a question for our consideration as we spend our few moments together this morning, and it's this. What is First Church worth? What is First Church worth? Now, I'm not talking about our physical and fiscal resources, but I'm talking rather about our intrinsic value as it relates to our community and our mission. What are we worth? Let's see. That's a good answer. In April 2011, uh, in an article in Christianity Today, a University of Pennsylvania professor named Rand Nahn did a study of a church, an inner city church in Philadelphia, First Baptist Church in Philadelphia. The study showed that through its mission, its ministries, its outreach, the positive effect it had in the inner city of Philadelphia, that it had a value of $6 million in one year in that inner city of Philadelphia. That's more than 10 times its annual budget. That'll make you think. That's pretty amazing. I remember a few years ago, I was at another appointment, and we were doing a time of vision casting, talking about the vision of the life of the church, and we invited a couple of facilitators to come in, and we learned a lot together. We learned about the history of the church. You know, why do we have that interesting-looking chair in the ladies' parlor? Oh, that's the reason why. 
Uh, we, we learned a little bit about the stories of faith that had led some folks to the church. But what stuck with me were some of the questions that were asked. One of the things that the facilitators really tried to get us to focus on were the so that answers. In other words, we as a church, we do this, we do that, we are this, we are that, so that blank. And that led to a deeper level of questioning. What is the so that of this church? What is it that makes this church absolutely vital to the community? In other words, if people got up the next morning and the church was gone from its location, would the community mourn its loss or would they even notice it all? Those are questions worth asking and answering. And it's in the process of asking and answering these questions that we are led into the, the complex and challenging dilemma that faces institutional Christianity and, and the faith as a whole. And it's this. What's our so that? Uh, one of the big buzzwords that's used when we talk about this idea of, of the faith and the church is the, uh, the word relevance. Anybody ever hear that word Relevance. Well, experts are telling us that for many people in our culture, the church is increasingly becoming irrelevant. There was an April 15, 2013 study from the Barner Research Group that showed 37% of adults consider themselves to be post-Christian. In other words, they had little to absolutely nothing to do with the faith or with the church. Among mosaics, people aged 18 to 28, that percentage was at 48%. That's stunning, isn't it, to think that something so precious to us, priceless to us, has absolutely little to no value to so many people. And it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to see where that trend, if it continues, is going to head. So the question for us this morning is this, what is our so that? What is it that gives us relevance and meaning in our community, in our lives, in this world? How do we recapture that as a congregation and as believers? Some people think it's just as simple as instituting a particular program or having a, 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 a better image. In other words, if we just do this program or that, or if we just soften our stance on this or that and become a little more cuddly on it, then people will, will come back. Well, working on the sermon this week, it seems to me that the path to real relevance is to be found through identity and purpose. Calvin Ratz in Leadership Magazine said, the church, if it ever hopes to be roused from lethargy, must determine why it exists and what God expects it to accomplish. If we want to hang on to the people whose hearts and minds are in the camp of the faithful, if we want to attract those who have turned their back on the church, if we want to become invaluable, priceless to our community, then we have to figure out who we are and what we're called to do. We have to move beyond being mere consumers and just fans of what the church and the faith can do for us and get back into the task of making disciples, of finding faith-filled answers to the so that question. And that's what Jesus is talking about in our passage today. And I think we need to reflect on those words as we come to an understanding of what's the difference. In the, this passage that we read this morning is part of a larger, what we would call a pericope, a larger section of scripture known as the Sermon on the Mount. And in this passage, Jesus is using rather common everyday discussion with his people, talking about the basics of the faith and about the basics of, of being a good disciple and trying to explain to them how to live that out in their everyday lives. And in doing that, he calls on a couple of everyday elements 
that has significance and meaning for our lives today just like they did for the people in Jesus' day. He talks about salt and he talks about light. Now these elements that bring flavor and preservation, that bring a vision and guidance, are a very powerful way to describe how we as the followers of Jesus are called upon to do the same for the world around us. They show us how we can find identity and meaning and relevance and value to the world around us. In other words, they show us how we can make a difference. Well, what does all that mean, Ken? Thank you for asking. We've got to understand some things. We have to understand, first of all, that we, as followers of Jesus, are being offered a unique identity and purpose. Did you hear what Jesus called us? He called us what? The salt of the earth and the light of the world. Now, notice he didn't use a future tense with that, did he? He didn't say, well, if y'all play your cards right, hopefully one day you'll make it to being salt. He didn't say, well, I feel like you're working in the right direction. Hopefully you'll eventually become light. He said, you are salt. You are light. When we come to salvation by faith and grace of Jesus, we are given this calling, this identity, and this purpose. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And notice this, these are rather unambiguous identities and purposes, are they not? Salt is what? Salty, right? And it makes food salty. That's what salt does, right? Light dispels darkness. It's bright. That's what it does. These elements, when they live up to their calling, these elements, when they're used properly, make a vast difference to the world around them. Yeah. The same is true of us as disciples of the Master. As we live up to that calling, we seize that purpose, we make a vast difference in the world around us. Think about it. You can have a pantry full of salt. I don't mean to get bubble gum on you here, but we can have Himalayan salt, and yeah. sweet salt, and healthy salt, and Line, salt. You have all that work. But if you don't sprinkle it on this popcorn, I promise you the popcorn is still going to taste like packing peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> and all that salt is there for nothing. You can have the fanciest light fixture in the world, the best bulbs, the LED bulbs. We watch a lot of HG. TV in my house. Oh, look at that light switch. Oh, Lord. You can have the best in the world, but if you don't flip that switch on in the middle of the night, when you go into your uh, living room to see what that noise is all about, I promise you the little radar in your little toe is going to find the chair leg. <laughs> or the table leg. I've got a witness here, it sounds like. And you're going to get it, and your little toe is going to be bent the wrong direction as you like. And that light fixture and those balls don't mean a thing. Jesus called us the salt of the earth and the light of the world. But if we don't seize on that identity, if we don't live out that purpose, then friends, I think it's a very valid thing to ask. What's the difference whether we're here or not? Retired Bishop Bill Willowman in his book, What's Right with the Church, talked about a group of ladies, sweet little ladies in the congregation, that decided they wanted to interact with their community and sort of reach out to people. And they, they, there was a prison in their community. They went out to, to minister to those folks that were at the prison. They would put together little, little good bags with toiletries and, and food and things like that, take it to the prisoners, and they would talk with them and interact a little bit with them. As they did that, they began to learn that the conditions of the prison really weren't what they were supposed to be. And the, the prisoners were really having a rough time of it. So they made an appointment to see the head jailer to talk to him about these issues. And they, they explained what was going on and asked if things could be changed to make things right. 
And the jailer kicked back and with a smirk on his face, he said, I knew it. I knew we were asking for trouble the minute we let you little old ladies in here. Why don't you stick to church business and leave the legal business to us? One of those sweet little ladies got up and slammed her fist on that desk and said, this is church business. They went over his head. An investigation was launched. And inconsistencies were discovered. The jailer was fired and things got bad. Now those little ladies could have chosen just to drop their care packages off and gone home feeling good. Nobody would blame them. But you know what? We're called to be more than just nice people. More than just do-gooders with a social conscience. We are called to be uniquely transformed agents of God's mercy and grace meant to make a difference in our community. We're called to be salt and light. And that's different. We have to understand we live in a world that is against the of salt and some light. Some of you may be familiar with the name Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon was a, was a producer of several TV series, along with some great movies like uh, Toy Story and The Avengers. He was interviewed by James Hitter in the August 27, 2013 edition of Entertainment Weekly, and he was asked about his opinion about the state of things in the world. He said, listen, I believe that humanity is getting stupider and more violent every day. It's beyond frightening, it's depressing, and I have no hope. And I think he's alone. I think there are a lot of people out there this morning, people who are confused, who are yelling at the barricades, who, if you look beneath this thin veneer that the world tells us is the good life, will see just how dark and how insipid life really is for them. They need, and they're dying for, a flavorful life. A preserved life and life. And as those who follow Jesus, we have been called to counter the message of the world, the message of decay and darkness, with the witness of life and life. Mike Howard, in his 2012 book, Glorious Mess, put it this way As followers of Jesus, we're called to share a message of life and love and hope in the midst of the world's pain and brokenness and hopelessness. The world is desperate for that kind of message. And I think he's right. So, we've got an identity of purpose, and there certainly is a need. So all of God's people ask, what's the difference? How do we find the so that? How do we find the relevance of the value as God's people at the corner of Van Norden and Second Street? Well, I think we have to answer so that. We have been called to be salt and light in the midst of a world that is in need so that we are to fulfill that purpose of being the salt and light of the world. Real relevance is found when identity and purpose intersect at the point of greatest need through the sharing of real relationships. When we really get to know and love the community in which we live, those people with whom we live, and we really intersect with their lives, that's when we begin to make a difference and become real to a lot of folks. And that's important for us to understand because oftentimes in the past, the world has sort of had an attitude, uh, the church has had an attitude, of drawing back from the world. We want to get behind the ivory towers, bless me, my wife, our two kids, us four, and another one. <coughs> Church mythologist Alan Kirsch made a really startling statement one time we were at a, a gathering at Eaton Street Church. And, uh, he made a really startling declaration, at least to me, I never thought of it this way before. He said, for the majority of Christians, when they become Christian, part of the church, within three to five years, they will have zero friends outside of the church or of a Christian thing. Zero. The only way that salt is going to make any difference in the world is if we're to get out of the shaker and mix what's been called mixed. The only 
way this light is going to make any difference is if I switch it on and I set it in a place of promise for it to be safe. As the salt of the earth and the light of the world, we are not going to make the difference we call it in until we accept our identity and purpose and we meet the world at the point of its greatest need. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that look like? Julie Baumgart, in an August 2006 article in Focus on the Family magazine entitled Marriage First, How a Community Save his families. Tells the story of the community of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Some of you have heard of Chattanooga before? <laughs> in the 70s and the 80s, Chattanooga was a decaying and dying city. Divorce was rampant. About half of all the births in Chattanooga were to unwed teen mothers. Single moms were the sole breadwinners in 30% of the homes in Chattanooga. It was a tough time. And so in August of 1997, a group of business, community, and church leaders got together to discuss the situation in Chattanooga. One of them, a fellow named Brad Ryan, or Rick, said, he realized, I had no idea what was going on. It was, it was stunning to hear those things. He said, I went home that night and immediately hit my knees and I began to pray. And I said, Lord, please use me to help you save families in our community. God's people in Chattanooga soon got together and they started an initiative called First Things First with three purposes. Let's reduce the divorce rate. Let's reduce teen pregnancy and let us strengthen our families in our community any way we can. They began to have classes at churches and other places to talk about strengthening marriage and family. They set up resource centers to help businesses and, and, and other efforts to do what they needed to do to help families and couples in their community. So what's the difference, you ask? In less than 10 years, the divorce rate of Chattanooga fell 25%. Teen pregnancy went down 26%. Julie Baumgartner wrote, God used these people in first and first to transform Chattanooga and restore countless families. I want you to think about that. A group of God's people got together. They heard what their community needed. They prayed about it. And then they applied everything they had at the point of that grace need. You think God's people have a value in Chattanooga, Tennessee? I think so. What does it look like for the people of Washington and Bozeman County? Well, maybe it begins with us having the humility to go into our community and get to know it better. To find out what its needs are. To find out where God's salt and light can intersect our community's greatest need. And then apply our full effort to it. Maybe it means that we lift our voices, stay in our minds, support with all we have those initiatives that are going to revitalize our community. Maybe it means supporting businesses in our community that are going to give our people an opportunity to earn a decent wage. Maybe it means giving our full support to those missions and ministries and, and outreach efforts that are designed to bring positive values into our families. Maybe it's just as simple as getting to know the person that lives next door to us and beginning to share our life with them in real and meaningful way, in a really meaningful way so that they'll look into our lives and see Jesus working in us and maybe they'll give a desire for a little bit of salt and a little bit of life themselves. As we accept that identity, as we live into that purpose, as we meet the world where it needs us the most, that's where we're going to find our group. That's where we find identity and worth and value. And that's what makes a difference. In the winter 2012 issue of Leadership Journal Magazine, Richard Stearns wrote an article called Shedding Language. 
He compared the, the current dilemma we have in the church to being in Disneyland. But talk to you. He said, think about it. Inside Disneyland, everything is designed for our pleasure. All we've got to do is show up, observe, participate. But outside of Disneyland, you know that's on the left coast. Outside of Disneyland is the city of Anaheim. And the city of Los Angeles says, and come. That's the real world with real problems, drugs, violence. Upscale neighborhoods surrounded by slums. That's a world where for many people in Disneyland, it's, it's unimaginable. And it's very easy for us to fall into the track and believe that our task as believers is to open the gates to Disneyland and let a few fortunate people inside so that they can escape what's going on on the outside. But the truth of the matter is our real mission is to knock down the walls of Disneyland and to intersect and make a difference in the community beyond. We're never going to reach our true network. We're never going to be as valuable as we can be to our community until we accept who we are and take on that task. <coughs> until we meet our community right where it has its need. With real, meaningful relationships. That's where we're going to find our so that. That's where we are going to know where we make a difference. Jesus called you and me to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Are you ready to take that on? You ready to take it on? Those who have ears, well, thanks to you guys. This time we prepare our hearts and minds for a time of Holy Communion. We are reminded that United Methodists, we believe this is the table of the Lord. We don't have the right or the desire to turn anybody away from the table. Though none of us are worthy of our own merits. You yeah. got the crumbs to make the table. The privilege of coming to the table as a child of the team was called for us to break rocks. So the appropriate time, come as you feel led. The method we use here is intention. You'll be invited to come forward. There'll be a couple of stations here up front. You'll be invited to take a piece of bread and dip it into the chalice and then receive communion. After which you may kneel at the altar for a time of prayer, or you may return to your seats. The task of being solved in life, that's pretty, that's pretty heavy stuff. And any time you get ready to do a big job, you need to eat a good meal. And so Jesus, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, <laughs> told his disciples together, he took a piece of bread, and he broke the bread, and he gave thanks to God, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take heed, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to God, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, I want you to drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Lord, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here today. On these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. This time, the last hour. Praise man to come forward and those who have been asked to help serve.
Jesus has a table spread and Jesus has come and died.